Okay, um, so welcome to the last talk of our workshop. Uh, we're going to do more about space time, quantum mechanics, combinatorial geometry at infinity. All right, well, it's really wonderful to be back at the uh, uh, CMSA. Um, uh, Burned uh, uh, exhorted us to um, uh, give uh, 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 basic. Um, simple talk, which I think is wonderful, and that's exactly what I plan to do to just talk about the most uh, uh, important aspects of the uh, subject as simply as possible. Um, uh, maybe I can, I can start by saying a, a, a few general things. Uh, um, I've been working on this sort of general area for a little over 10 years now, and um, you know, of course there's all kinds of wonderful interactions between mathematics and physics going back centuries, but I want to stress that this particular interaction is crazy at the moment. And it's not something that grew out in some logical way from other things before it. It's, some, it's, it's sort of, it, it came out of left field. Um, uh, and it's bizarre. We still don't deeply understand uh, what it's about, which, of course, also what's, what makes it so exciting. Um, and uh, perhaps a proof of this is that uh, uh, just as an individual, I'm someone who works on the subject because I'm not remotely a mathematical physicist. Uh, I'm a physicist who loves mathematics, but that's a very different thing. I'm, I'm definitely not a professional mathematical physicist. Um, and the fact that uh, I've been drawn into these crazy things about uh, uh, involving uh, the notions of uh, combinatorics, positivity, uh, and all kinds of other things is an indication of uh, what physics is asking us to uh, do. Um, uh, that's what I find fascinating about this business, that it's about very basic physics. It's not about fancy schmancy things. It's not about uh, thinking about the partition function of some esoteric exotic theory evaluated in some esoteric exotic manifold. Uh, it's about what happens in the world outside our window all the time, you know, constantly. Um, and, uh, and when that kind of thing happens, and there's some indication from actual nature for uh, something going on about basic things that you didn't know about as a physicist, I feel you have to pay attention. And that's what I've been trying to do, is, uh, pay attention. So, um, uh, the, the main actors in this drama are really these two big principles of, uh, of the physics of the, of the 20th century. Um, we have the uh, we have the, the, the picture of space time, the quantum mechanics, and the and the uh, uh, theoretical framework to talk about space time and quantum mechanics at the same time. Theories that are compatible with the principles of Lorentz invariance and of quantum mechanics is quantum field theory. And you know, by the middle of the 20th century. Um, uh, we started learning how to talk about the physics. Um, for example, if we talk about scattering processes, uh, we draw Feynman's diagrams. Um, so we draw this diagram, and we see some other diagrams, um, uh, that's, uh, and so on. And um, uh, each one of these is meant to, uh, they're not the same diagrams, right? Yeah, I almost drew the same diagram. Yeah. Each one of these is uh, meant to uh, represent some particular process in space time. Um, uh, it's meant to represent the interactions that take place at points in space-time, um, so it's local, uh, and we're supposed to add up all the different possible ways that the interactions could happen because that's how Feynman taught us to think about quantum mechanics and sort of all possible histories. So those are the sort of two basic things. We're supposed to imagine local pictures in space-time. We're supposed to add them all up uh, in order to uh, uh, get the answer for uh, physical observables. And famously, when you do this, in practice, um, you get incredibly complicated expressions uh, in intermediate steps. There is no reason to expect a priori that you should get simple answers. Um, uh, it doesn't look simple. And yet, when people actually did the calculations uh, for practical reasons uh, in interesting theories that were relevant to describing collisions at uh, accelerators, for example, they found tremendous simplifications. So they found that the hundreds and thousands of pages of algebra would collapse to a single term. Uh, and 30 years ago, when people first observed this, it was not clearly that uh, it was not clear that it was a tip of an enormous iceberg. And today we know that it's the tip of a really enormous iceberg, and that we should try to figure out where this uh, where this um, structure is actually coming from. Uh, now, there's uh, I could spend an entire hour or two talking about uh, internally within physics why we expect. Uh, that in the, in the next stage of evolution in our subject, we have to figure out how to replace space-time, and perhaps even quantum mechanics, with some deeper principles. 
um, out of which we'll see them emerge in some way. Um, uh, this part is entirely un uncontroversial. I think almost everyone in theoretical physics would expect that the notion of space-time has got to be superseded in some way because of um, questions involving quantum mechanics and gravity. It's even conceivable you've got to go beyond quantum mechanics in order to talk about uh, situations where we attempt to apply quantum mechanics to describing the entire universe rather than observations within a universe. So uh, there are reasons to expect that we've got to supersede these uh, principles, and yet they're hardwired into the, way, the usual way we think about things. So how could that possibly be, that we're going to have to make an advance to totally replace some principles with new ones that sort of look nothing like them? Um, well, that's happened to us before in physics when we went from classical to quantum mechanics. Uh, we went from classical to quantum, that's also an enormous shift. We lost the, perhaps the most central feature of classical physics was that the laws of nature are deterministic. There was an enormous leap to go from that to quantum mechanics where you learned that they're not. It's a binary shift. And in no sense is quantum mechanics just a little tiny deformation of classical physics. It's a different perfect structure. Um, and the way it reduces the classical physics is subtle. It isn't there some parameter that you sent to zero and it turns into classical physics. You can't change the entire sort of grammar of what the theory is about when you do that. So instead what happens is that uh, in the limit where you can uh, think of Planck's constant as small, you, you reduce to a way of thinking about classical physics that actually doesn't look that deterministic. Um, Newton's laws look entirely deterministic, um, but uh, the Planck's constant zero limit of quantum mechanics doesn't land you on Newton's laws. It lands you on the principle of least action. The principle of least action is a formulation of classical physics that doesn't look that deterministic when you first learn about it. It looks like the particle is sniffing out all the paths from A to B and choosing the one that minimizes the action. It looks like it's thinking about where it's going next in order to figure out what to do. Um, so that's a very mysterious feature of the laws of physics. At any given moment of time, there are many ways of talking about it. There are many ways of rotating your head and thinking about, uh, uh, thinking about what, what the underlying principles are that give you the same answers in the end. And some of those are better suited to the next level of description than others. So uh, back then, it was determinism that had to be lost. And a great way to be prepared for the loss of determinism was to rotate your head and discover the principle of least action. In other words, discover a way of talking about classical physics where determinism isn't the star of the show and other ideas come to the fore. Well, today we need to perhaps lose uh, our, our reliance on the notions of space-time and quantum mechanics. And so we're invited. One way to attack this problem, there's all kinds of ways to attack this problem, but one way to attack this problem, the way that I've personally found uh, most compelling, which is why I've been spending my time on it, um, is to try to think about ordinary physics. No speculation about anything, just to totally ordinary physics, but learn to talk about this ordinary physics where you never say these words. <laughs> and so you talk about the actual observables, the actual amplitudes for these scattering processes, but you try to think about them without drawing these pictures. Somehow uh, get the final answer without ever thinking about evolution in the interior of space time and ever invoking something like the Hilbert space where this sort of wave function is supposed to be involved. So that's the... That's the idea. This is supposed to be the analog of discovering the principle of least action in order to sort of prepare us potentially for the transition to the next step, where, which allows us to generalize beyond uh, these uh, principles. Anyway, that's the highfalutin philosophy, but of course, the, 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 uh, as I just alluded to, there's a practical reason for believing it's true as well, that if we use a completely standard formalism, which I remind you whose entire purpose in life is to manifest the rules of space-time quantum mechanics, you get thousands of pages of algebra when the final answer collapses to a few terms. That's an, a much more concrete indication that by making the principles of space-time and quantum mechanics manifest, you're hiding something else. And we should try to figure out what that something else is. Um, uh, and it's a very con concrete question. Now, why is it a very con concrete question? Because what are amplitudes? Uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, uh, the, the particular question of what particles gather. There's actually analogs of this kind of question um, in cosmology, and there are even geometries, uh, baby versions of the geometries that we've been seeing for amplitudes already seen in uh, cosmology, but I, I won't talk, talk about that today. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, uh, particle scattering, you know, we have uh, some function in the end of uh, um, some function the end particles of the momentum of the particles and the spins of the particles. Okay, so that's the, uh, the spins are some, some integer. Okay, so um, 
Uh, okay, so let me for the moment ignore the spin. Just think about them as functions of uh, momenta. So the momenta satisfies some on shell conditions like p squared is equal to m squared. Okay, so, um, and they satisfy momentum conservation, uh, which would. Okay, so, so that's our kinematic space. So that's the space the amplitudes actually depend on. They just depend on n momenta. Let's say the particles are all massless, it would be n null momenta. Uh, on the support of uh, momentum conservation. And that's it. That's our space. This, so this is our canvas. Here's our canvas. Is I have this sort of a space of n momenta, p1 through pn, some 4 by n or p by n uh, matrices. And this is the space where the amplitude lives. This is what it depends on. And so uh, our challenge is, how do I ask a question in the space of n momenta whose answer has all the richness and complexity of the scattering amplitude. So we've got to ask a question in this space whose answer are all the interesting functions that you spit out by doing the calculations in the conventional way. Right? Okay, so this, this looks a little difficult. This seems like a very arid, there's nothing going on in the space of n null momenta. Right? What, 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 what's going on? Well, there's various other ways that we could talk about it. For instance, if we only have uh, scalar particles especially, um, we can work in terms of all the possible dot products. So since we know the answer is the Lorentz invariant, that's another way of labeling the uh, uh, kinematic space, the so function of all possible dot products. That also satisfies some constraints because of uh, uh, momentum conservation. Or there are other variables. Sometimes we like to use these uh, twister variables that are, I won't explain what they are, but they're, uh, they're even simpler in some sense. They're entirely unconstrained uh, uh, four vectors associated with every, with every part. Okay, so, uh, but all the spaces have this kind of feeling to them. Okay, so they, they're just the, this is the, the kinematic space. It's, it's roughly n four vectors or n choose two, uh, roughly dot products and so on. So that's our canvas. And in this space, we have to find a question. So that's the goal of the subject, is not to find an answer, but to find a question. <laughs> We're trying to find a question to ask in this space whose answer are the amplitudes. And the, the interesting thing, the surprise, is that despite the very arid seeming boring appearance in this space, there is just enough structure in, this, in these spaces to find some combinatorial objects that are associated with certain geometric objects, and, uh, and then asking for functions or forms that have appropriate kinds of singularities on the boundaries of those geometric objects determine the functions that are the scattering amplitudes. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, the rough idea. So this is the at infinity part. When I say the geometry at infinity, what I mean is this is the data that an experimentalist far away from the collision region actually measures. They don't go into the interior of the space time to see what happened in the middle. They just throw particles in from infinity and see them coming back out to infinity. So the data that labels the process is just this stuff. So this is the sort of kinematic space of things that are accessible to an, an observer at infinity. Uh, and this is the space in which we're trying to find some combinatorial geometric, some kind of structure. Okay. All right. Okay, so. Um, now, by now we have a number of examples of this, but I want to focus on the very simple example. Um, and uh, just to be concrete, although it's, it's, it's uh, as far as the singularity structure of uh, uh, amplitudes goes, it's, uh, uh, it's much more general than this, but just to talk about a very uh, Concrete theory. I'm going to talk about a theory of just an interacting uh, scale of field interacting with a cubic coupling. So phi is an n by n matrix. So this is really some phi a b, phi b c, phi c a for that trace. And so the basic interaction um, uh, looks like the simplest Riemann graph. Okay? So here is the index a, the index b the index C, and the arrows tell you whether the index here was upstairs or downstairs. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the most basic interaction. And then I can just glue that interaction together to make more complicated diagrams. So uh, I can do at four points, I have diagrams like that, and so on. Okay. I might not keep drawing them. Uh, I'll go back and forth drawing them as double as, uh, as uh, 
ribbon graphs and, and ordinary graphs. But um, they're always meant to be uh, ribbon graphs. Okay, so, so if this is, uh, uh, you know, this could be index 1, 2, 3, 4. But I'll, I'll, okay, so um, so what is this? Uh, uh, so uh, if I if I say I'm going to call this momentum p1, p2, p3, and p4, then okay, this diagram would have a, uh, would have a, a propagator with that sum of momentum there, one over p1 plus p2 squared. Um, Notice it could have been 1 over p3 plus p4 squared. p3 plus p4 is a negative of uh, p1 plus p2 by momentum conservation, but I'm squaring it, so it doesn't matter which one I choose. And here it would be 1 over p2 plus p3. Okay, so momentarily, let me just draw them as ordinary diagrams again. And of course, I can. Um, uh, uh, because of the underlying uh, ribbon graph structure, there is a natural ordering to the external points. So I'm just drawing planar diagrams. And so uh, it's also very natural to associate surfaces with these diagrams in the standard in, 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 in the standard way. So we can think of one of these diagrams as actually defining the triangulation of a surface. And the surface is just the dual of this diagram. Okay, so if I take this picture, and I just draw a dual, and then I get a triangulation of, of a square. And indeed, I can think exactly of one of these uh, ribbon graphs as defining the triangulation of a surface. Every cubic vertex of the ribbon graph is one of the triangles. Okay. So when you glue triangles together, and the way the boundaries glue together to give you an oriented surface is nothing other than a single Feynman diagram in this language. So if you take a single Feynman diagram with this trace phi cube theory, it defines one triangulation of a surface. Okay. So, um, but it's actually a little bit easier to draw the uh, 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 surfaces, so, so I'll do that. So in this case, this would be one of the Feynman diagrams. This would be another one of the Feynman diagrams. If I go to five points, um, this would be one of the Feynman diagrams. And again, just uh, dually. Right, that. Um, and so, what is the uh, what? Uh, and let me say one 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 more thing. Um, uh, uh, since the momenta add up to zero, it's reasonable to draw the momenta end to end in some d-dimensional space, whatever space they live in. But if you draw them end to end, they form a closed polys. Right. So this would be p1, p2, and so on up to the end. Now, you'll notice, uh, let's say, in, in, in this picture, uh, all the momenta that I see, so this would be P1, P2, P3, and so on. You'll notice that this momentum is like P1 plus P2. Uh, this momentum is P1 plus P2 plus P3. So all the, all the momenta that I see in these diagrams are just correspond to distance squared of sort of chords in this uh, and gone. Right. And in fact, um, so uh, so each one of so so I can think of a bunch of variables x i j, which would be just p i plus p j minus one squared, maybe plus the mass squared of the particle, whatever it is. So these are kinematic variables, right? They're 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 just uh, they're, they're natural kinematic variables. They're the poles of the amplitude. Um, and in fact, uh, I can say that the amplitude, um, at least in this approximation where I'm only drawing tree diagrams, it is the sum over all the triangulations of my n-gon of the product of all the 1 over x i j's where the i j's belong to the triangulation. Okay. I'm just saying there's a propagator for every, uh, so I draw a triangulation, I multiply by 1 over x for all the um, for all the chords, and that's the amplitude. Okay, so that's the answer. Uh, I'll just make a, another quick comment, is that uh, it's very easy to see that um, uh, all the possible dot products I have are pi dot pj. So this 
So there is n choose two of these. But because I have momentum conservation that says the sum of all these four vectors, all these d vectors is equal to zero, that tells me that the sum of, of, of for i not equal to j of ci e dot dj is equal to zero, is assuming that the particles are massless. This is really that's just, that's just, that's just, that's just okay, a kind of concrete assumption. So, uh, so the number of independent invariants is n choose 2 minus n for this, uh, uh, for this condition, which is exactly the number of cores of the n gone. So this is an especially nice set of variables. Not only are they the guys that show up in the actual tree amplitude, they're also a basis of all the possible uh, invariants. All right, so now, in this little toy version, so this is the answer, secretly known, the answer from some Feynman diagrams. And now we want to ask a question. This is now a, a sharper version of our grand challenge. What is our kinematic space for this problem? Our kinematic space, the space at infinity, the kinematic space at infinity, is just this, all the space of all these x's. Okay? That's it. So those are the variables the answer can depend on. How can we ask a question in this space that has this as the answer? That's what we're trying to figure out. Okay. Other than go and add up the sum of all the uh, uh, triangulations of the uh, uh, n gone. Okay. Now, there is a very basic clue. And this basic clue is the, is the clue that we see over and over and over again everywhere this structure has shown up in, uh, in, in field theory. In every example, it works like this. And actually, uh, it's a good guide when you're in a new setting to look for this kind of question to see what the possible connection to the uh, geometry might be. And the, the clue is that there's, there's, there's combinatorial structure that's associated with the singularities of the amplitude. So in this case, the singularities are just poles, okay, but there's something interesting about the pole structure. So what is interesting about it? So imagine that, again, this is what's going on behind the scenes, what you don't know. Someone has just given you this black box that's function of the xij's. You don't know this is what it is. So you, you move around the xij's, you measure it, right? And you see what patterns about it might uh, make you stand up and take notice. Okay, well, well, one thing that you would notice, there are two clear things that you'd notice. One thing that you'd notice is that when the xij is going zero, there's a pole. Okay. Another interesting thing, and, and that is the, if I draw it back in terms of uh, uh, Feynman diagrams, um, that's just saying that um, that's this uh, important picture we see over and over again, that while we have some object that makes sense for generic momenta, if some, I tune some of the external momenta so that the sum of the subset of them, if I tune it so that P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared goes to zero, then there's a pole. Now, that's already uh, reflecting the very basic physics of space-time locality, right? That's, that's the kind of pole that I have. I don't have poles that look like 1 over p squared, t squared, minus r squared, t squared of this sort of variety. I, I don't have much more complicated kind of poles, right? Um, no, the only poles that I have look like simple poles in 1 over p squared. Okay? So the fact that I just have simple poles in 1 over p squared, this is the physics of space-time locality. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that in the neighborhood of this pole, in the neighborhood of this pole, uh, so blowing up like one over uh, xij, but what I get is exactly what I see from this picture, that uh, the residue on this pole is the product of two lower amplitudes. So that's saying that that's, that's the interpretation, that this is blowing up because uh, what used to be a virtual particle is becoming real, and so it's blowing up, uh, like any resonance process. And you have to be able to interpret the way it's blowing up as the amplitude for producing this intermediate particle, and then the amplitude for uh, decaying very far away. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is times some amplitude on the left times the amplitude on the right. And uh, if, if, if the location of the poles is the physics of space-time, 
This is the physics of quantum mechanics. So this is where quantum mechanical unitarity comes from. The fact that all the probabilities add up to one is ultimately due to this, uh, uh, to the fact that you should be able to interpret uh, the amplitude getting large as something else happening using a particle that then decays, uh, goes out a long way uh, before it decays. All right, so, so very vividly, our two big principles are telling us something very concrete about what this uh, function looks like. It tells us what kind of singularities it has and what it has to do on the uh, on the singular. So, so, yeah. so, so the second point just says that uh, it's multiplicative. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's uh, it's uh, multiplicative. And if I just say it again in the language of these uh, endons, I am associating a function. I'm, I'm, asso I'm asserting an amplitude with some uh, endon. And the first thing that I learn is that. It can only have singularities with some uh, xij goes to zero. And the second thing I learned is that as this xij goes to zero, it has to go like 1 over xij times the amplitude for this side times that side, right? OK. OK. So what we want to do is somehow ask a question in kinematic space that just doesn't put this in by hand just ask some natural question in, in kinematic space that does that and does that. Okay, that's our, that's our goal. Now, to this audience, I don't need to tell you that all of this screams out for the isosahedron. Okay, because there's a third fact. There's a, there's a third fact, which is uh, not in all the physics textbooks. This is in all the physics textbooks. Yeah, there's a third fact that's not in all the physics textbooks, which is also very striking, that's known to most of you, which is that there's, in fact, a polytope. Even combinatorially, there's a polytope out there whose vertices are all of these Feynman diagrams, or whose vertices are all of the triangulations of, 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 of an n-gar, and whose facets are partial triangulations of an n-gar, right? Which is, it's that very, very, uh, you know, I, I like to tell the story to really imagine that you're an experimentalist who didn't know what was going on, and you're just twiddling these xij dials. Well, you might discover that there's a pole here, and then if you do very precise measurements, you might discover that it factorizes. But if you're a laser experimentalist, you discover something more striking. That, you know, you make it have one pole, and then you move around the axis and say you can have two poles, you can have three poles, four poles, but the pattern in which the poles come together isn't random, right? If you see, uh, if you move things around so that uh, uh, you encounter a pole and that happens, then you never see a pole when you set that to zero, okay? You only see another pole when you do something compatible with that, compatible with that, okay? And so if you then just try to make a picture for all the ways that the poles can come together, you would discover to your amazement that the picture forms a polytope. And that's not, uh, at least, you, you might not even know that it's a polytope. You might not know you can cut it out with uh, uh, flat inequalities, but you discover something that's, uh, that's combinatorially a ball, right? That's not at all a manifest fact. Um, that's why it's not in all the physics textbooks. And yet, this fact about the isosahedron also knows about this physics. Because of this famous fact as well, that the facets of the isosahedron are just products of lower isosahedron, okay? in exactly the way that you predict from this picture. Okay, so, so this is already an example. There is something in xij space. There is an isosahedron that lives in xij space. Now we're going to be more precise about uh, how precisely an isosahedron lives in xij space. But there should be a way of asking a question in xij space that brings to life the isosahedron. Uh, and um, and that knows everything. It knows not only it knows about these two things, it also knows that there's a polytope behind it, which is sort of hidden. Uh, certainly, as I said, it's not in, on page five of all the physics textbooks, even though these things are. Okay. Okay. And again, I'm not going to, given given the time, I'm not going to tell you much about uh, about how precisely we associate. Um, functions with the geometries. Okay, so, so we're going to find some geometry in xij space. We're going to find a way of discovering the associated in, in xij space. And the amplitude is always going to be related to the geometry by finding a, a form that lives on the, kin on the kinematic space that has uh, prescribed singularities, logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of the geometry. Okay? So that's the very basic connection between boundaries of the geometry and singularities of the form. Okay? So that's the, that's the sense in which the, the geometries are combinatorializing or geometrizing the uh, singularity structure. Um, 
uh, just to just to press this uh, just to press this uh, point, if you didn't know about any of this, if we didn't know about the association ahead of time, one way that you would see there's something interesting going on is just by counting how many of these partial triangulations are there, right? You know, so and you discover something something amazing that if you kind of had the thought maybe could it be that they fit on the sort of facets of some nice ball, you would do a, uh, you would do an Eulerian sum. <laughs> Okay, with uh, v minus v plus f, um, and you'd find to your amazement that the numbers in the, in, in, uh, the intermediate numbers goes up, can become enormously large, but always adds up to zero. The only are simple always add up to zero. Now, in this case, ahead of time, we knew that such an object existed, but in the in the much sort of fancier setting of the amplitudes, this was one of the ways we discovered the amplitudes. That's one of the ways we knew it was there because we had the functions. We are wondering if there's a geometry behind it, so we took the functions, we looked at the singularities, we counted them all carefully, we did the ordinary sums, and to our amazement, all the millions, numbers of order millions in the middle canceled out, we got zero. We got this ball all the time. That says that there is some sense in which this pattern of, of uh, singularity is, is deeply, clearly geometric. And so, so, that's the, so there's a lot of content, uh, even sort of counting content, combinatorial content to this fact. Um, OK. but. Um, so in the, in the rest of my time, I want to tell you, in this very simple setting, how we can discover uh, the isosahedron in kinematic space. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to tell the artisanal version of the story to you. In other words, the sort of version as uh, the story that began in collaboration with Song He and Gong Wen Wang and Yan Tao Bai and then developed further with uh, some of the same cast of characters when I was last year at the CMSA, uh, including Julio Salvatore here and Happy Frost. And, um, and where, it, where we started off at tree level, where the surface was just a disk, at one loop where we just had a disk uh, with, a, with a puncture. And much of the pandemic, uh, we've been working on extending this to all surfaces, all loop border. Um, and there's a lot of extra fascinating things that come in. It's not a trivial uh, generalization. But um, taking Burns' exhortation into account, uh, I will just be telling you about uh, the story of the disk, uh, or just the uh, tree amplitude, but I'll tell it in a way where every idea uh, generalizes uh, um, to all surfaces, at least the way of thinking about it. Um, but actually, I won't start doing it that way. I will start in this very uh, 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 artisanal way. But just to give you a flavor of the kind of ideas uh, that are involved. And the artisanal approach to the, uh, to the isosahedron, and it generalizes to all surfaces. Yeah. So, um, and there are going to actually be two parts to this story. Uh, so just to say, what is our, uh, so, uh, our, our, our kinematic space always, our kinematic space is just the space of xij. Uh, on a general surface, it's just a variable associated, um, uh, this is in general, all homotopy classes of parts on the surface. For a general surface, for the for the case of a disk, it's just these, uh, it's just the uh, chords, um, and there's two aspects of the story. So before getting into the actual details, I want to tell you the sort of big picture of what the, what the two aspects are. One aspect is sort of polytopal, tropical, tropical fan oriented, and um, we've we've seen that that uh, for the disk. There is a polytope, the isosahedron, that has its vertices, all the triangulations of the surface, and all the partial, all the facets correspond to partial triangulations. And, and the facets exactly reflect the kind of pinching of the surface that you would expect if you pinched along any given arc. So that idea generalizes to all surfaces. So that there's a, there's a polytope associated to any surface uh, that does exactly the same thing. Now, in general, it's a lot more interesting because there's infinitely many curves in general on surfaces beyond the disk. And so it's a polytope with a very interesting fractal structure. Um, and there, there's a lot to be, uh, there's a lot more to be said about it. But, uh, but that's the sort of zero order idea. It's that there's a polytope that captures all of the combinatorics of, uh, of a surface, including what happens when you take any arc on the surface and pinch it. And so if you pinch it in such a way that it, it disconnects in two, you get the product of the corresponding surface. You pinch it in such a way that it opens it up, you get the corresponding surface. So, okay. so everything that, that happens by pinching the curve is reflected in the facet structure of the uh, polytope. 
Okay, so uh, so this is all, and here the star of the show are equations of the following form. Um, and I'll write it for the case of the uh, well, uh, equations of the following form for any pair of arcs. Remember, we're associating variables to any pair of arcs on the surface. Um, there is an equation of the following form: x plus y minus the sum over x d is equal to uh, some constant that depends on x and y. Now, what is this uh, equation? This is saying that if I take two arcs in general that cross, so this would be an arc x and an arc y, then uh, we're used to things like skeed relations that would tell us how to uncross these guys. Now, normally when you think about skeed relations, there's many ways of uncrossing. Well, there's a one particular unique way of uncrossing that is associated with these, uh, uh, with these pictures that's actually dictated by the underlying triangulation. So, so we start with a triangulated surface, and for a choice of triangulation uniquely dictates what this, uh, what this uh, looks like. And we just write down a relation like this for every pair of intersecting arcs on the surface. Um, with now the very important point that these constants are positive. And we ask for all of the x's to be positive. So this is a special instance of a general phenomenon in this uh, entire story. You go to this kinematic space, um, and after you organize how you think about it a little bit, which is step zero, the, the really important step one is to say the word positivity. You say the word positivity, and it's the word positivity that puts the, all the structure on. Okay? So um, this we saw most dramatically in the story of the positive Grassmannian and the amphitheatrin, where all that's going on is positivity and counting sign flips and, and simple topological questions about the uh, configuration in the kinematic space. But anyway, there's something similar going on uh, here. Now, uh, why do these equations do something good? Well, just, just to give you some idea about it. Um, uh, remember, if we think about the uh, sauzedrin, we, we, we're supposed to have a facet corresponding to every arc. And in particular, if two arcs are, are, um, uh, are incompatible, if they cross, the polytope better keep them apart from each other, right? We, we don't want them to cross. They can't cross, so those facets can't meet in the polytope. Right? So that's the sort of most important job that the polytope has got to do. Um, uh, after that, of course, um, it's the uh, totalitarian principle that everything that's not uh, forbidden is compulsory. So everything which is allowed to, uh, to go to zero together must show up at the vertex of the polytope. So those are all the diagrams, all the triangulations of the surface, all the Feynman diagrams must show up as vertices. But also everything which is, uh, but certainly the things that are incompatible must be kept apart from each other. And that's exactly what this equation guarantees. If you imagine these equations could all be made consistent with each other, that's the, that's the non-trivial non part to show that it's actually possible, but this is the beginning of the story. Um, if you could do that, then you can see why it does the job. Because it, I can't go to a boundary of the polytope, uh, remember all the x's have got to be positive, I can't go to a boundary where I set uh, x and y to zero if they cross. Because if I do, some of, a bunch of negative things would have to be positive, which are the contradictions. So that's the way that, uh, that, that these, uh, this, this big stack of uh, equations cuts out an interesting part. Associated with this is a remarkable fan. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a fan that you can uh, talk about independently of, of, uh, think, uh, of, of any uh, uh, associated polytope. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, part one, but this is one aspect of the story. And it's related to particle amplitudes, which is exactly what I was talking about. Okay, part two of the story is sort of a nonlinear version of this. It's a detropicalized version of all of this. Okay? And there is a bunch of beautiful nonlinear equations that are associated with curves on a surface. Okay, so here are the uh, equations. For every arc x on a surface, again, it's true. We'll talk about it in detail for the disk, but I'm telling you things that are true for any surface. There is a variable that we call a u variable, u associated with x. And now, remember here, the purpose of the polytope is to keep apart variables that are uh, incompatible. And we can do it, but there are sort of moduli here. We can move things around. We can move these c's around in some way. The polytope isn't rigid. I, I can sort of change its shape to some extent. Okay. But there's an even more rigid realization of this combinatorics, but it's curvy, it's nonlinear, it's not polytopal. And it's associated with the following equations. 
you write down the following equations for every x. ux plus the product over all the other curves in the surface, there could be infinitely many of them, of uy, and the exponent is just the number of int uh, intersections between x and y equals 1. So that number literally just counts the number of times the curves x and y cross when you draw them on, on the surface. Okay? Now, it is, should not be obvious that these equations are sensible. In other words, naively it looks like I have as many equations as I have unknowns. So maybe the solution's in points. But it has, it has actually a, a, a moduli space of solutions. It has a space of solutions that, that uh, has a dimensionality given by the uh, the dimensionality of the Tachmirillo space of the surface. So, um, so in other words, it's correctly parametrizing the space of all possible, let's say, hyperbolic metrics on the surface. There are many other ways of uh, talking about it, but, but it's correctly characterizing the number of independent degrees of freedom of curves on the surface. So that's 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 the really non non-trivial fact. These equations have solutions and the correct dimensionality of the solutions. They're highly nonlinear, but they have solutions. Okay. Now that forms a manifold, the solution. Yeah. Now, why does this? Why do these equations? Why are these? And, and just, just, just to say, uh, we know of various ways of uh, we know of various ways of solving these uh, these uh, equations. The most explicit ways of solving them are to write the U's. If, uh, if, if our space is n-dimensional, if the underlying, if the, the the correct dimensionality of the, of the uh, space marks on the surface is n-dimensional. So we're going to parametrize it by, by n variables. Uh, and, uh, and there's various ways of, uh, uh, of writing these uh, absolute explicit solutions for the U's. Um, and I'll write two forms. I'm being a little schematic, but when we do the explicit example for the disk, you'll see exactly how it works. So the, they're the ratio of, of uh, uh, two other auxiliary objects. It's something that looks like a cross ratio of uh, two things upstairs and two things downstairs. Now, this form is connected to hyperbolic geometry of the surface. And these lambdas are lambda lengths. And these are sort of literally cross ratios certain cross ratios that you can define associated with the surface. On the disk, they're literally very standard cross ratios, which we can, we can define. This is a little more abstract. These are f-polynomials, and they're most naturally associated with some uh, quiver representation theory, also familiar to cluster algebraists, although the cluster algebra setting is not precisely the correct one. Okay, so it's really a more general notion uh, that is uh, associated with the quiver. And, and these are not identical, but they're closely related to each other. Okay, so there's one way of solving for these uh, nonlinear U's as a simple function of some more basic objects that are associated with the surface. These lambda lengths are sort of literally geodesic lengths that are associated with the hyperbolic metric, the space of hyperbolic metrics they put on the surface. Um, uh, and these f polynomials are, are somewhat more abstract. I think the, I'll, I'll actually, it, it's uh, easier to give the final formula for any surface in terms of this form, uh, which maybe in 15 minutes I won't be able to get to, but maybe 20 minutes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Eric. Okay, yes. You, you said you're not quite in the cluster algebra setting, no. but then what do you mean by f polynomials? Oh, I'll tell you what I mean. It, it's counting sub representations of uh, multiple representations. Uh, but in fact, I'll, I'll give you a, for the, the special case of surfaces, you can be much less fancy. It's something that, yeah, you can be much, much less fancy. It's a particular quiver? Huh? It's a particular quiver. So there's a quiver associated with any surface. Yeah. Oh. But, uh, with any triangulated surface. Uh, oh. But yeah, I'm not going to assume any knowledge of any of that. Uh, I just want to now just tell you a little bit about, um, ah, but sorry, uh, before I do that, um, why is this, uh, why do we call this a sort of a binary realization? So we call this a binary geometry. Um, 
And well, because this is doing in a curvy way what the polytope is doing in a linear way. See, if I now again say the word positivity, if I now demand that all these u's are positive, then what do these equations tell me? First of all, they, 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 they tell me that, uh, that because of these equations, if the u's are positive, they also have to be less than 1. Take the sum of two positive numbers uh, equals 1. But then something very beautiful happens, that if, if you stand u's of x to 0, so that's a boundary, then all the incompatible u's, all the incompatible uh, uy's must go to 1. Because that's the only way that if this goes to 0, that's the only way that these equations can be satisfied is if all the rest of them go to 1. So this is much more rigid than the polytope, where I'm just keeping them apart, but I can wiggle things around. If this is just 0, 1. And you can use both this idea, as well as the earlier one, and they're very closely connected to uh, each other, to write explicit formulas for amplitude. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll actually tell you what it looks like starting from this one, because it's... Uh, so, remember, uh, and again, this isn't a form that would be true for any surface. So these views have some... The u's are solved in terms of some y's. This is a sort of a positive parametrization. So that when the y's are positive, the u's are positive. That's, that's, that's the point. Okay. So. And so you can very naturally look at the following uh, integral, dy1 through dyn. Just take the product over all the curves of the surface, the u for the curve, and raise it to the power of the momentum squared that you associate with the curve. Okay. Now, if I draw a disk, and I draw some curve like that, then uh, I know what momentum I associate with that disk. We just said that it's the sum of all these momenta, right? And that generalizes to any surface. Uh, you just have to uh, assign momentum to the boundary components of the surface. Let's say you have some more complicated surface here. Okay, it's an extra boundary component, maybe some higher units, whatever. Um, you draw, you you pick, you you pick a basis for the uh, homology of the surface, and then you take your curve and you expand it in the base of that homology, and you're done. That defines what you mean by, by the momentum of any of any of any arc. And the momentum squared is independent of orientation, just like we saw in the case of the disk. Okay? So this is a perfectly uh, well-defined thing. If you're in a situation where uh, you know I might need uh, this as an element of the homology, that doesn't have a defined momentum in terms of the boundary guys, so that would be a loop variable. We then have to integrate over it. Okay? So those are where the loop momentum variables come from. Uh, they're the unfixed uh, the elements of the homology that are not fixed by the boundary guys. So this, at the moment, you can think of as an integrand which would depend on the, this is a, this is an integrand, uh, an integrand that would depend on the momenta as well as a bunch of loops, loop momenta, okay? But if you look at this, this form, um, what's, uh, oh, and I'm integrating these from zero to infinity, okay? Um, why, why should this be related to anything good? Why should this do anything good? Where can this thing have singularities? This, this guy can have, oh, sorry, this is dy1 over, this is a d log. This can have singularities when some of the u's go to 0. Because remember, the, zero, the u's are just between 0 and 1. So this can only have singularities when some of the u's go to 0. But crucially, when a given u goes to 0, what's regulating it is p squared. So everything will be finite so long as all the p squareds are not equal to 0. But if some px squared goes to 0, there is a region in the integration domain where I'm going to have something blowing up, and it'll blow up as 1 over px squared. Okay, so that's exactly what, what, what we wanted to see. But furthermore, what happens in the neighborhood of that locus? Well, the u for this guy is going to 0, but the crucial point is that the u of all the incompatible ones is going to 1, and therefore they drop out of this formula. And all you're left with is the u's of the simplified surface. Okay, so, uh, so the singularities of this integral perfectly captures the cutting and pinching, the, 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 the pinching singularities of the surface, which are exactly the factorizations that we expect for amplitude. Okay. Now, 
Uh, this integral actually depends on some parameter, alpha prime, that is units of length squared, in order for that exponent to make sense. And so, in fact, what this integral gives you are string amplitudes. So the act of going from the sort of tropical polytopal world to this binary, more rigid uh, world of the U's is generalizing from particles to strings. And if you tropicalize these expressions with quite a lot of uh, uh, important subtleties that I don't have time for, the most important subtlety is that when you want to reproduce uh, a real string amplitudes, these x's have to include every single curve on the surface, including self-intersecting curves that we don't see when you have the disk, but would show up the moment you go beyond the edges. Okay, so there's an enormous stack of curves. Every single curve on the surface has got to be written down. And if you do that, these very simple looking formulas already at one loop, um, you know, the disk with a puncture, have Jacobi theta functions in them. They have all of the wonderful things that we expect to see in string amplitudes. Okay? So this is really an interesting representation of uh, string amplitudes from this much more combinatorial uh, point of view. Um, but you don't need all of those surfaces and all those self-intersecting curves. Uh, you see, the, 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 the self-intersecting self curves, um, because they intersect themselves, the u's show up in both terms of this equation. So they can never go to zero. So there's never any singularities associated with sending them to zero. You can freely throw them away and be left with a much simpler, smaller integral. And that integral is guaranteed to do exactly what the, uh, what the particle amplitudes want to do. And in particular, if we take alpha prime goes to zero and replace these u's by their tropical versions, then we get new representations of field theory amplitudes. They're not string theory amplitudes. They're not just taking the string theory amplitudes and sending alpha prime to zero. They're really different. Uh, and they, uh, they have different singularities. They have different properties. They're more general. They're not, they're not tied to this very, very specific representation you get from string theory. So there's a kind of a larger world of objects that are associated with surfaces. A very special point in them is real string theory. Um, with some details I'm not uh, uh, spelling out. But there's a more general uh, set of objects. There's a much simpler set of objects that still have an alpha prime in them, uh, but which you can then sort of canonically send to zero and just be left with field theory amplitudes, sort of tropical integrals, uh, concrete integrals that uh, give you here the actual the integrand. But you will notice in this form, if I write u as e to the minus some little u, that this form is exactly looks like the Schwinger parameterization that uh, uh, Sebastian was talking about in the last talk. And in particular, it allows you to do all the loop integrals, uh, simply Gaussian integrals. So you're left with a generalization of the semantic representation for amplitudes, not just for one graph, but for all the graphs combined together in a single object. Right? That unification of all the graphs into a single object is exactly accomplished by these u variables. OK, so that's just a sort of a big picture for what's going on. There's a tropical polytopal story, and there is a, uh, a nonlinear binary story. And having said all that, I have uh, 10 minutes, so let me at least give you an idea of where these things come from, uh, or how these things work in the case of the abyss. Okay. But this will be in the, uh, as I said before, this will be in the artisanal form. So this is the artisanal uh, so see. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, kinematic space. And I'm just going to, um, I just want to represent all the variables. My, 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 my variables are just labeling all the chords in this picture. So I'm just going to draw them. But I'm going to draw them like this. And you'll see what I'm doing in a moment. You'll notice, what, what, what have I done here? All I've done is started from like any, from 1, 2. 1, 2 is just one of the edges here. So that's actually not one of our variables, right? That's, uh, that would correspond to p squared, p1 squared, that's equal to m squared, or 0. Some, it's, it's locked to something. So these guys are special. 
But then all I'm doing is just uh, translating by the natural cyclic action. I'm just moving the endpoints of my curve okay, in uh, two directions. I'm just choosing to draw it in this. Uh, I'm just choosing to draw it in this way. So obviously, I could keep on going to infinity. This would be to one, and so on. Okay? And I can I can keep uh, I can keep going. But you notice if I do keep going, first I just keep going forever. Um, uh, but I I I will uh, copy the same curve over and over again. Right? You know, so for example, here is two one, there is one two. There's a guy there who will be the same as the guy here, and so on. Okay. So all I'm doing here in drawing this chunk is just choosing a way to to capture all the variables once and only once. Okay. And I can do it in any way. You can. So there's just this infinite strip, and you just choose any any way of taking a chunk out of this infinite strip where all the variables are captured once and, and only. once. Okay, so we call this picture uh, a kinematic space-time. This is not to be confused with the ordinary space-time. This is like a, a, a this is a sort of a one plus one dimensional um, uh, space-time, quote unquote, where I think about this as time and I think about this as space. Okay, so uh, why am I doing that? Well, remember the most important thing in about uh, the most important thing we're trying to capture is whether chords cross each other or not in this picture. Okay? And so, uh, if I imagine sort of just drawing this, never mind drawing a mesh, just sort of drawing it in the uh, continuum, then it's very easy to see that if two chords cross there and on the polygon in this strip, it means that they actually have to be the past and future corners of what a physicist would call a causal diamond. Okay. So you shoot bright light rays out of this point into the future out of the... So if this is IJ, this is KL, then IJ intersects KL. If, if you draw the future light cone out of IJ and the past light cone out of KL, they intersect in a way that fits inside this strip. And so you can see that, for example, here. 3, 6, and 2, 5 intersect. Okay, so 3, 6, and 2, 5 intersect. And okay, that's good. So there's this little diamond between them. Okay? On the other hand, uh, two, you know, uh, 2, 4, and 2, 5 don't intersect. So they're not the past and future corners of a light cone that fits inside the picture. About 1, 4, and okay. 2, 6. Sorry? 1, 4, and 2, 6. 1, 4, and 2, 6. Okay, yes. Yeah, 1, 4, and 2, 6 are. So 1, 4, there's 2, 6, and there's a nice diamond that fits inside this cone. Okay. Also yeah, it, 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 etc. It, it has to be so. So yeah, you have to be able to take the backwards forty-five degree lines and the forwards forty-five degree lines, and they have to they have to they have to intersect inside this space. Okay, they have to intersect inside this uh, strip. All right. So that's kind of interesting. That the the question of compatibility is now a question about sort of causal relation in this FACO space-time that I've introduced. Okay, there's a FACO notion of time and space. Now, just to say, what is this notion of time? What does it mean to move up in time? This time is pushing the endpoints of the curve. Right? So there's a sense in which two curves are close to each other in the space-time is whether you can get from one to the other with a few moves of pushing the endpoints. If they're far, they're far. Okay? And that's a notion that also generalizes to all surfaces. And so there's a kind of a notion of time like this. And more generally, it's a connection with quiver representation theory to people who know this notion of time is the auslander Wrighton notion of tau, or time. Okay, so, so there is something, uh, so this, uh, this is not an accident about this uh, picture. This is, a, this is a kind of a relatively deep fact about the way curves on surfaces are connected to each other. There are closer and further ones, and it's, and it's important to understand. Okay, but now, uh, but but with this uh, basic, um, uh, with this basic uh, data, I'm now going to tell you how to discover the um, uh, associated. Okay, so this is our kinematic space, um, and uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question in this kinematic space, okay? and my question, see now that I have a time and a space. Um, if someone, if you're a physicist and, and someone told you you have physics in one, one plus one dimensions, what's the first sort of equation that you would imagine writing down in one plus one dimensions? Is the wave equation. 
I could write down something like dt squared minus dx squared uh, equals zero. And so, okay, what's the discrete version of the uh, wave equation? Now we have a bunch of discrete points. The discrete version of the wave equation says, take every mesh in this picture, take every little mesh in this picture, I'm going to associate it with a variable, so uh, I'll just call it past and future and left and right, but I'm just talking about just the little tiny meshes, right? And I'm going to just write down the formula x past plus x future minus x left minus x right. Okay? Now, that is exactly the discrete derivative that turns into the wave equation, the limit as the mesh gets small. Okay? So, but this is the sort of discrete version of the uh, wave equation. And now I'm going to put a source on the right hand side. So if I draw a kind of a smaller example here, not, let's say I just do this example. So this would be for n equals 5. Okay, then what I'm saying is that I'm going to write down a bunch of uh, uh, equations. I think that I have the wave equation in this space. I'm thinking that I'm giving the initial data on this past surface. So I give initial data on this past surface, and I solve the wave equation to determine what everything is inside. Okay, so, so, and how do I do it? I just write down that formula for every little mesh. So for example, I write down x24 plus x13 minus x14. And remember, these frozen guys on the outside, their x's are set to be 0. Right? That's the mass squared. I'm just saying that it's uh, 0. So it's x24 plus x13 minus x14 minus 0 is equal to some constant. And so I'll label that constant by uh, where I started, 1, 3. So similarly here, I would write down x14 plus x25 minus x24 minus x15 is 0 equals c14. And finally, I'd write down x24 plus x25 minus x25 minus 0 equals c24. And so that's my discrete wave equation. So you notice I have five variables here, 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 4, 2, 5, 3, 5. Those are the five chords of my pentagon. And I've written down three equations, so that's good. So I'm going to, if I give, if you give me initial conditions for 1, 3, and 1, 4, then I can solve for the rest of them. Okay. So is this yeah. like a display Riemann surface? Um, a little bit similar. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you plonk down a bunch of points in your, in your, in your sort of uh, covering the inside in some, uh, in, some, in some natural way. Yeah, you, you could think of it. In this case, you could think about it. Uh, well, here you can definitely think about it that way. Um, uh, we don't know exactly how to think about it in that way for general surfaces. It would be very nice to learn, very precise, but certainly roughly it is, it is like that. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, now. Uh, as I said before, so here is our dynamics. We've made a sort of dynamical guess in kinematic space. We've gone to kinematic space, and we're doing the wave equation in kinematic space. Why? Because causal structure in kinematic space somehow matters. Some causal structure in kinematic space is telling us about crossing coins, which is locality and space time. Right? So this funny causal structure in this funny kinematic space is the, uh, is the moving idea now. Um, and uh, now we can just add, now comes, as I said, uh, the magic word positivity. I ask the c's to be positive, and I ask the x's to be positive. I ask everything to be positive. And so what does that tell me? If I plot, what does the region look like that's compatible in the x13, x14 plane, which are my initial conditions here? Here are my initial conditions. Well, I clearly have to in the upper quadrant that just x13 and x14 is equal to a zero. But I'm going to get three extra constraints from x24, x14, and x25 being positive. And what you get is a picture like that. So you get a pentagon. And that's a particular realization of the associated here, just for the, the, the n equals 5 uh, associated. If I work out what these uh, corners are, um, uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fast now. Uh, this, uh, this, this corner, this, this is C13, this is C13 plus C14, and this is uh, C24 plus C14. Okay, so this is a particular realization of the uh, associated. And if you do this for any n, you always get an uh, associated. 
Now, there's a very simple reason you always get an uh, associated group that I can explain. So it's, it's not an accident. So clearly, we get a polytope. At any end, we're clearly defining a polytope. Right? Manifestly, it's a bunch of inequalities coming from the top. So it's polytopal. And it also obviously factorizes into simpler polytopes when you go on a, when you go on a facet. Okay? And that I'll leave as a little exercise uh, for you guys. But I'll draw the picture sort of in the continuum limit. Um, if, if a point here is set to zero, then, uh, then by the, this causal diamond logic, uh, I can't set to zero anyone in any of these regions. And no one can go to zero in any of these regions because they are, if they did, they would be in the past or future uh, formula of a light code relative to that guy. So nobody in here can ever become a boundary. You can never set it to zero. And furthermore, you can solve for everybody in here given the boundary values uh, elsewhere in this picture. So you can entirely reproduce everything uh, when you set this uh, x to zero. You can entirely reproduce all the x's in the picture from a simplified one where you scrunch that region away. So you're left with this little triangle here and a bigger triangle there, on each one of which you have the same wave equation problem set up. So that's the way in which you see that the boundary of one of these polytopes is just a direct product of two polytopes of exactly the same type. Okay, so this is a picture now, so again, just to give you, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, you will think this is just randomly pulled out of nowhere, and it, and that's why I said it's artisanal. Okay, but this was where the story started. Um, and all of this, the structure of the polytope, the, the fact that it looks like this, the fact that it's normal fan is a very famous fan, um, They, all of this is uh, actually follows from nothing other than thinking about drawing curves on the surface and essentially doing nothing else. You just draw curves on the surface and you do some projections of curves on the surface and you land on these pictures. So there's really nothing artisanal going on. But, uh, but if I started that way, you would lose patience um, uh, before you see what is uh, going on. Uh, but let me just uh, just say a, a, a final thing for two minutes and, and I'll end. So this, this shows you the kind of question you can ask in kinematic space that uh, brings these uh, geometries to life. But there's a really there's a really interesting thing about this association. It's not a random association. You see, it's, it's drawn in this very special way with these parallel sides and so on. And um, the most important feature of this uh, of this representation of the association, is that it's actually uh, the Minkowski sum of a bunch of simple pieces. This would not be true if I moved the, if I squashed it around and tilted it a little bit, it would not be true. But, but there's something remarkable that it's the Minkowski sum of a bunch of simple pieces. And why is that obvious from our picture? Well, remember, I've motivated everything by the wave equation, right? So if, I'm, if I, someone tells you to solve a wave equation with a source, what do you do? You use a Green's function idea, right? You ask what happens if you just turn on a delta function source. You solve it for that, and then you, you know, add up, you, you average over all sources. What's the analog of the, of the Green's function idea here? Is just turn on one of these little meshes and turn everything else off. Okay? So if you just turn on one of these little Cs to be one, and put all of the rest of them to be zero, you can ask what happens to the polytope. And of course, it degenerates tremendously. And so what happens if I send C1, what, what happens if I send the Cs to, to zero here, is that I either get this interval, or that interval, or this little triangle. As I send C13, C14, sorry, yeah, as I send the Cs to zero, I get uh, these things. And so therefore, by the, by the Green's function trick, the whole polytope is C this plus C prime that plus C double prime that. And for the appropriate C's that I have uh, uh, worked out. And so this whole picture makes it manifest. Not only there's an associahedron, but the associahedron is built out of the Minkowski sum of simple pieces. It's that fact that it's a Minkowski sum of simple pieces that's, uh, that's the, the real magic here. Because um, uh, uh, if I think about the, uh, the normal vectors, the facets of this polytope, I get a normal fan for a polytope. Um, as I mentioned, we can discover that fan, or even uh, without drawing any of these pictures, the existence of that fan follows very simply just by recording the uh, data about uh, uh, just thinking about uh, uh, anyway. That, 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 that the fan is a very canonical thing. It has nothing, uh, nothing to do with uh, any of this stuff. 
Um, but, uh, and it is, it's really interesting that, uh, that just starting from a picture of curves on a surface, uh, you see that you get a bunch of cones that tile all of space, and each cone is interpreted as a bunch of compatible variables coming together. You think it was a Feynman duck. So this is, I think, is really remarkable that you just start with the picture of curves on the surface, you project the picture in a particular way, and you get this set of cones that tile all of space. Each cone is a diagram, you have to take them all together, otherwise you miss. You need to take them all together to cover all of space. That's all, that's all, that's all very beautiful. But still, when n is large, we have Catalan number of vertices of these, uh, of these associated groups. So that goes like 4 to the n at large n. So you have an exponentially large number of vertices, and that's why the Feynman diagrams are hard. Now you believe you're summing over exponentially many, uh, you have to sum over exponentially many cones. What this picture is telling you is that that fan, which, is, um, uh, which is, uh, has exponentially many cones, is actually the common refinement of a small number of pieces, each one of which has a small number of uh, rays and a small number of vertices. That's really remarkable. That, and it would definitely not be true if you took the fan and you jiggled it around a little bit. All the combinatorics would say exactly the same, but it would just not be true anymore. Right? It's this very specific form that tells us that we can, we can, we can generate the, the exponential explosion of uh, all, the, all the diagrams with, uh, with uh, a polynomial amount of information. Okay? And uh, very concretely, there's uh, what these U's are, what these U's are, uh, have a very natural interpretation uh, in this fan, a very natural tropical interpretation. If someone gives you the, uh, some complicated fan, any piecewise linear function on the fan is, uh, is determined by giving its value in all the rays. So you might want to find what is a piecewise linear uh, function uh, that is just lights up one ray at a time, right? So it depends on some x, so some, some function, piecewise linear function that depends on, on an arc x, such that when you evaluate it on the ray y, you either get, you get zero unless uh, uh, it's on its own ray and you get one. That's a very natural object to try and build uh, for any fan, and naively it would take an exponential amount of work to get that, because after all, there's exponentially many cones. So it's piecewise linear on exponentially many cones. This fact that the polytopes are a Minkowski sum tells you that, in fact, there's a small formula that you can concretely write down for any n, analytically, that gives you what that tropical function is, that lights up any ray, one at a time. And it's that formula that allows you, uh, anyway, so that, uh, that object exists, and um, it has a, it's a simple tropical expression, and that simple tropical expression is the tropicalization exactly of these U's that I, uh, that I uh, talked about. Um, if I say one final thing here, if I look at these pieces, this piece, if I were to write a polynomial associated with it, remember this is the 1, 3, and the 1, 4 direction. This piece, I would write down this, this polynomial, 1 over 1 plus y3, this would be 1 over 1 plus y4, this would be 1 plus y14 plus y14 y13. Okay, so these, uh, so this guy I could call um, okay, so uh, I associate them exactly with the C's that I turned off. So every one of these guys is uniquely associated with the, with the, with the corresponding mesh uh, that, I, that I turned off. So in this way, they're uniquely, one of these Minkowski summands is naturally associated with the polynomial that goes along with each one. These are the F polynomials. These are directly the, uh, the F polynomials. And there is a formula for the U's. Okay, so uh, here is 1, 3, 1, 4. So, so here, here is the formula. So, uh, so you can go away and check that I'm just writing this so you see that uh, um, I'm 
not telling you exactly what the rule is for getting it, but, um, but you'll see that it basically looks like f, f over f, f, although this example is so small that you don't see all the f's upstairs and downstairs. And finally, we have uh, OK, so you're invited to check that if you take the, the, the pentagon and you just look at look at u, u13 plus u24 and u25, those are the two curves that cross 1, 3, which means you're equal to 1, okay? and so on. Okay? So these are the explicit solution of these nonlinear equations in terms of these f polynomials. And these f polynomials are, have a tropical origin. Okay? The, 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 the f polynomials are related to the, uh, are related, are, are related to the Minkowski sum ends that build the uh, thing. Okay? So the summary is, there is this very interesting combinatorial structure in the poles and the singularities of amplitudes. They're captured by a polytope. But what's really special, really, really special, is that that polytope is the Minkowski sum of simple pieces. Okay, that's really hidden. Okay, the, the fact that the polytope is a little hidden, but the fact that the polytope is the Minkowski sum of a bunch of simple pieces is really interesting. And it's that that allows really new formulas for the amplitudes to be written down. And it's that which is the connection between particles and strings. So essentially, when you see that it's built out of the Minkowski sum of simple pieces, you're just one epsilon step from generalizing from particles to a string. Essentially, all the formulas you write down for particles, you detropicalize and get string. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for your patience.